Good morning, all, and welcome to this informational meeting regarding the extended day ahead market. Uh, making the presentation today, uh, our representatives from the California ISO. Um, I want to express the commission's appreciation for you all coming uh, all the way to Montana to see us. We appreciate it. Uh, There's something that's uh, critically important to us as we try and deal with resource adequacy uh, uh, issues moving forward. Uh, let me uh, simply say first that uh, here's President Brown uh, with us in person on the uh, Zooming in with us uh, will be Commissioner O'Donnell and Commissioner Fielder. Uh, Commissioner Pinocci is in travel status. Um, I'm going to uh, take a page out of my old playbook as a county agent running 4-H meetings and start at the back of the room and have all of you introduce yourselves. Thank you all and welcome. Now we'll begin by introducing Holly Taylor, who is the manager of external, external affairs, easy for me to say, uh, of the California ISO. And uh, Holly, again, appreciate you all being here and uh, we'll simply uh, turn things over to you and uh, off we go. Well, thank you, Vice President Johnson. Um, thank you for welcoming us. Um, good morning. President Brown, um, welcome on the phone to Commissioner O'Donnell and Commissioner Fielder. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are delighted to be here in your beautiful city of Helena, Montana for this briefing on the extended day ahead market straw proposal um, to answer questions that you might have and to provide an overview of what that straw proposal entails. Um, so with me today is Phil Pettengill. Phil is Director of Regional Integration. Also with me today is, is Milos Bosnik. He is the Regional Market Sector Manager for Market Infrastructure Policy. Um, these two have been very deeply engaged in um, engaging stakeholders across the West in the development of this straw proposal. So they have a lot of knowledge that they're bringing to the table here today. Um, on the EDAM straw proposal, which really builds upon the ability of the Western energy imbalance market to increase regional coordination, support state policy goals, and also cost effectively meet demand. So again, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. And with that, I will turn things over to my colleague, Phil. Great, thank you, Holly, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Brown here in attendance. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about this. Um, the extended day ahead market is um, really an op a great opportunity and one that we're excited at in terms of working with stakeholders across the rest of the West. So we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, what Milos and I are gonna do is, is walk through a set of slides. What we thought we'd do is start with some of the technical content and walk into what is it we're doing, uh, sort of walk through those initially, but then we'd really like to open this up and have a dialogue. If there's questions, anything like that, we'd certainly like to uh, entertain that with you. And then we'll sort of, after we work through that, you know, uh, uh, understanding uh, what is it that we're talking about, we've got an opportunity to then move on and talk a little bit about next steps. Um, Holly's gonna talk to us a little bit about how potentially governance would change in the ISO uh, with the advent of the EDAM. And then we'll talk with you all a little bit about our stakeholder process and how to engage with us as we go through the course of the next almost two years in order to develop this, this market and, and put that in place by early 2024. So that's what we had constructed for today. Um, so with that in mind, what I thought I would do then is sort of dive into that technical content and we'll th move through this um, relatively quickly, but then stop and have a, uh, have a dialogue with all of you if there's any questions. Um, one thing I thought I would do, we realized as we were looking at our slides, I think it's important to lay a foundation with one key term. You'll probably hear Milos and I mention numerous times as we talk about um, the day ahead market. What we're talking about is how is energy transacted um, over a 
fairly, fairly large footprint. You're familiar with our Western energy imbalance market. And that piece of market actually covers now over 80% of the load in the Western interconnection, the 13 states that make up the Western uh, interconnection of, of the United States. Um, but that's only happening in the five and 15 minute kind of time frame. That's, that's really uh, what we refer to as real time. Today, we're going to talk about what's happening prior to the operational day. And there's a fair amount of activities that we do today for our portion of the system in California. And when I say our portion, the California ISO also operates a, a day ahead market for the balancing area that we're responsible for in California. And let me stop there for a second and just lay the foundation in terms of what is a balancing area. It's important because what we're really talking about is how to meet the, the regulatory requirements that are set by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and then promulgated by uh, NERC, which is the National Electric Reliability Corporation. And what they're doing then is taking those standards and imparting upon them on all the balancing areas across the U.S., in the Western interconnection, we have 38 of those. So the California ISO balancing area covers about 80% of California, but there then of course are 37 other balancing areas across the rest of the interconnection. What we're talking about then in those balancing areas have specific reliability requirements. They are responsible for balancing the load and the, and the resources to match that load, but also acquiring uh, uh, contingency reserves so if they lose a major transmission line, lose a power plant, those kinds of things, they've got reserves already online or available to them to keep the energy flowing 24 hours a day. What these day ahead markets do is create an opportunity to now more efficiently determine what is the set of resources that can meet those reliability criteria. And, you, and then we do that with, of course, some fairly sophisticated computer software. We're gonna to talk today about the outputs and the inputs of that software. But we also need to know what's the transmission grid that's gonna be available. So it's not only the resources, but the transmission. And Commissioner Johnson, you mentioned resource adequacy. We're not gonna spend, spend a lot of time talking about resource adequacy because in the EDAM, the way we're constructing it, the balancing areas and therefore the regulatory authorities like yourself still retain all the responsibilities for procurement deciding what resources to buy and deciding what transmission lines to build as well. What we're going to talk about is how the market can help optimize the use of those resources. And when we move to the day ahead timeframe compared to the real time, about 95% of the energy is being set up and committed and organized in that day ahead timeframe where less than 5% of the energy is actually being transacted in that real time environment. So this is where we get an opportunity to actually look at some fairly substantial savings um, from that efficient operation in the day ahead, but also really improvements in reliability. Because if we can look at how to establish that operational dispatch over a larger footprint, you now have an opportunity to have a more reliable system because of the diversity of resources that are now made available. So let me just, with that background, start to dive into some of the slides. And what you see here up first is to really describe what is the three main blocks or building blocks of, of benefit that we see coming out of the day ahead market. And not only because we're talking about EDAM, but day ahead market in general, because as I mentioned, the ISO has been running a day ahead market since our existence uh, to over 20 years. I've been at the ISO for 25 years. So all of those 25 years, we've been running a market in this day ahead timeframe. It's of course evolved and changed and we expect it to evolve and change as all of us are going through the changes that we see in our environment and the selection of resources that are gonna be done across every one of those different balancing areas. But what the EDAM provides is an opportunity, as I mentioned, to economically determine the dispatch in the day ahead timeframe, to look at what's the most efficient mix to meet the 24 hour load curve. So the three main inputs that we're looking at is the transmission system, the generating resources, and what does the load curve look like? Um, and of course, different resources and different um, loads are gonna create different challenges. So that's where that diversity benefit comes in. When we look at a broader footprint, we've got an opportunity now to use the transmission infrastructure 
to use the set of resources in a larger footprint to meet sometimes very challenging changes in the load profile as your loads start to change and or the resources start to change and how to match those. Finally, all of us are looking at what's happening with greenhouse gas. There's a number of other states in the West that already have specific requirements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And what the market will do is actually look at what those requirements are. And in the cases like in California, where carbon has a price applied to it, the market should know about that and consider what are the implications of that. In other states where maybe there isn't a carbon price, Similar to what you have here right now in Montana, if there's no carbon price, the market actually doesn't need to consider what that is. And we're designing a market that's flexible enough to either consider the price where it's in existence or not where it's not. So that's the benefits that we see coming out of the EDAM in a very, very high level. And what I'd like to do now is sort of spend a little bit of time telling you, what is it that we've been talking about? The, the extended day ahead market, and the reason why we call it the extended day ahead market is we're essentially taking the day ahead market that we're already running and we're extending and making that available to those other 37 balancing areas I mentioned that are in the Western interconnection, including those that are here in, in Montana. But we've been start having a dialogue, a very detailed dialogue that really kicked off in January of this year to cover three main processes. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here now in this opening dialogue, but what Milos and, like, and I would like to do is maybe come back to this slide with you because this gives us almost a checkbox where we can go through some of the big pieces that are being discussed and where you may have some more questions, we could certainly elaborate on those. But let me just take a few seconds and say, What's important in any day ahead market is all the pre day ahead processes that need to occur. And as I've been touching on, most importantly is understanding what is the transmission that's available for the market to run that energy transfers on. And then what is the set of resources that are gonna be available to try to match that load profile that I mentioned earlier. Inside the market, once we run the software, there's gonna be a number of processes that are occurring within that, including market power mitigation, because some generators are not necessarily owned by utilities or some, and so we wanna be able to understand is any one or few generators having any potential market power? And if so, how do we mitigate that in these markets? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, resource participation. How does that work? So Milos is gonna talk about that as well. And then, of course, after the market has run, and that takes a few hours, it starts at 10 a.m. in the morning, outputs are done around 1 p.m., then we have what happens after that market. And what's important here is to recognize what we're identifying as transfers between those balancing areas and how we do the cost and the settlements um, for those transfers and for the purchase and sale of energy inside the market. But really, what that happens is that day-ahead plan gets handed off to what we all now know is the Western energy imbalance market. And that becomes the base schedule that is being used in the, in the Western EIM on a going forward basis. Um, so I'll stop there on this slide and then just uh, one more slide and I'm gonna hand it off to Milos. Because what I wanted to do is wrap up a little bit in terms of what are some of the key features. If we step back just a little bit and think about what's happening in the extended day ahead market, there's really four things I wanted to share with you. First and foremost, joining this market is voluntary, just as it has been in the Western EIM. Um, it's going to be relatively easy to enter and easy to exit. Uh, we really see it's important to have a low hurdle to, to get in and get out. Um, from a time standpoint, we're anticipating that might be as little as six months. Um, but again, we're not done with the design. There's still lots of stakeholder discussion to go forward, and, and that will be one of the key uh, building blocks. There's a day, day ahead resource sufficiency evaluation because entities in the different balancing areas are coming into this market with a set of resources. It's appropriate and necessary for them to be able to show they have enough to serve their portion of the load. And that way they aren't indiscriminately leaning on or using somebody else's resources via the market uh, construct. So a day ahead sufficiency test is really essential in our mind to create equity across that market. I mentioned transmission, and of course, transmission is a central and critical piece in this to try to actually bring as much transmission to the market as possible, and that can actually help create benefits for all parties that are engaged in, in this uh, market outcome. 
And finally, as I mentioned, one of the outcomes of the day ahead process is transfers. So we want to make sure that to the extent there is a commitment to transfer energy from one participating energy uh, or EDAM balancing area to another, um, those, those sales and purchases are going to be really important for folks to be able to rely on those, especially if system conditions get tight. And we'll talk about that a little bit in terms of where we are in the stakeholder process and discussion today. So I'm going to stop there and hand it to Milos, and he's going to dive in a little bit deeper on some of the other topics. We've got a few more slides for you, and then we'll stop and uh, take some questions and have a dialogue with you on this, some of this more technical material. So, Milos? Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I think I have only about three or four slides. But as, as Phil mentioned, um, resource efficiency and uh, making transmission available to the market are key components uh, that go that feed into the day ahead market optimization and ultimately provide some of those benefits uh, of the market. I'll focus here on the transmission component uh, in particular. And one of the things that, that Phil mentioned is we're looking to maximize the transmission that's made available to the EDAM in order to derive those benefits by transferring those resources and that generation across different EDAM balancing authority areas. Um, in maximizing that transmission, we've uh, created effectively this concept of transmission buckets. In, a set, in essence, it means that you have different transmission customers today that hold transmission rights, and then you have the transmission provider who sells those transmission rights. The transmission customers that have the transmission rights can voluntarily make that transmission available to the market. And this, I'm talking here about in particular transmission between EDAM balancing authority areas. Uh, because those are the transfers. You have resources in, in one balancing authority area that could be cost-effectively dispatched and committed to serve uh, the demand in another balancing authority area. And you can have these transmission customers make that transmission available to the EDAM, to the market, in return for what we call transfer revenue or congestion rents. But that transmission has already been paid for. The transmission provider is, has recovered that revenue because that tra the transmission customer has procured that through the open access transmission tariff. And so here, to the extent there's congestion, they will be getting some of these congestion revenues in return for making that transmission available. You have also then the transmission that the transmission provider has that they're making available for sale through their open access transmission tariff on a first come first serve basis. To the extent that there's any unsold transmission, firm transmission, high quality transmission between two EDAM balancing authority areas, that transmission can also be made available then to the market and the transmission provider will be compensated for that transmission. Uh, we're looking at different approaches for compensating for that transmission, uh, but one that's kind of coming to the top and that we're still evaluating with stakeholders is effectively, if the transmission provider makes that transmission available, uh, the intent is to keep the transmission provider revenue whole from a revenue, transmission revenue perspective as a result of EDAM participation. We could envision that that EDAM balancing authority area, that transmission provider, as a result of participating in the EDAM, there may be some foregone transmission revenues like non-firm transmission and potentially short-term firm transmission that's made available to the market. We've put out a number of options where the transmission provider and that EDAM entity would effectively recover their revenues through the EDAM to be kept whole financially. So they're no worse off as a result of participating in EDAM than they are today from the transmission revenue perspective. We recognize that's an important component, transmission uh, revenue recovery and not shifting costs among transmission customers. So we put out a number of different options in the straw proposal that, that put forward different ways of ensuring that revenue recovery in the EDAM uh, from a transmission perspective. But I think the main point here is that really we're trying to find incentives and ways of ensuring that or providing incentives for the transmission provider and the transmission customer to make as much transmission available to the market to be able then to derive those sizable benefits of optimized resource commitment across the broader EDAM footprint, that sharing of resources that can be then delivered on that transmission that's, that's been made available to the market. Uh, just briefly here, conceptually, um, as Phil noted, there's pre day ahead activities that occur. There's positioning oneself from a resource perspective, ensuring that each EDAM balancing authority area brings sufficient resources to the table to ensure that they can meet their resource efficiency requirements. Effectively, what that means, you bring sufficient resources to the market and to demonstrate that you can meet your demand plus a level of uncertainty and reserves. 
uh, similar to what each of these balancing authority areas do today, that they position themselves prior to the day ahead market. They're looking ahead, determining what are my load obligations, what are my other obligations of folding reserves and meeting uncertainty. And in the EDAM, they will do the same. They just bring those resources and that transmission now into the market, which is that day ahead, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. time frame, where we do a resource sufficiency evaluation to more formally determine, have these entities brought enough resources to the table to meet their obligations? If they have, they've passed the resource sufficiency evaluation. If they have not, then there may be certain um, consequences that flow out of that. If they have not procured enough resources, uh, that may mean that the market may have to secure additional resources, or potentially there may be uh, a need to uh, limit transfers. That's what we put forward in this latest proposal is if you don't bring forward enough resources under normal conditions um, on the grid, meaning that we're not in stress conditions, there may not be a consequence. But if we're in stress conditions or anticipating stress conditions, then if you don't have enough resources, you're able to secure those resources through the market at a bit of a higher rate. Uh, since you didn't procure those ahead of time. But there's a resource sufficiency evaluation that occurs then between the 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. time frame. And all of those resources and that transmission is made available to the market. And the market in that 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. time frame ultimately identifies that optimal resource commitment and the transfers between balancing authority areas to meet the overall needs of the footprint, the demand, the uncertainty, uh, and other obligations. Okay, and I'll turn it, we have, I think, two, two more slides, but I'll turn it over to, to um, Phil to just briefly touch on GHG accounting. Yeah, thank you, Milos. Um, so I mentioned this sort of in my opening remarks, and, and I won't spend a lot more time on it, but just simply to say that within any uh, electric market design here in the Western interconnection, because of multiple states having GHG kind of policies in place, we know we're going to need to have some type of uh, uh, approach to deal with this. We already have one in the Western EIM design. And at this point, we're leaning towards an approach that would be very, very similar to that, meaning that um, specific generators that have a carbon cost can communicate to us, the market operator, what that carbon cost may be, and then the market can take that into consideration. And that's what I've mentioned here in this slide, which is the resource specific approach. Now, talking with stakeholders, stakeholders have actually proposed an, an alternative solution, and that is to try to do something based on a zonal type of method, wherein where there is a GHG zone compared to uh, uh, many of the other states that are currently non-GHG zones, we look at a price or a, a hurdle rate that would uh, need to be overcome to move energy from one zone to the other. Um, so there's still a fair amount of, of, of work and trying to define what this is, how it might work, and certainly interface and uh, dialogue with the various state regulatory entities uh, to understand whether this would work for them for those areas that do have a GHG approach. So I won't spend a lot more time on it other than to just uh, uh, make you know create a sense of awareness that this is something that's also in the dialogue um, it really affects areas where there is a GHG obligation and those costs can be reflected and we'll do that in the wholesale market design. So Milos, I think that's all I had on that one. Thank you, Phil. Okay, and I think we're down to the last two slides more on the substance, but um, one of the key things as well that we mentioned is that we believe that EDAM, the different design features that we've put forward and, and we're working with stakeholders on, really provide the opportunity to enhance the reliability of the footprint as a whole and position each EDAM balancing authority area to be in a better position uh, from a reliability perspective um, in the EDAM than, than on its own. And here are a couple of elements that I, I, I mentioned already. One of the reasons is the they had resource sufficiency evaluation where each EDAM entity brings sufficient supply to the table to meet their forecasted needs plus uh, an amount of uncertainty similar to what they do today. But now imagine in that wider footprint, you have each EDAM balancing authority area bringing in that uh, robust amount of um, uh, capacity effectively to the market to meet that demand plus the level of uncertainty that now the market can optimize as a whole across the footprint. If there are any changes in conditions from uh, between day ahead time frame and real time, that broad pool of resources can be redispatched to, to meet those changes in conditions, whether it's changes in load, whether it's changes in you lose a generator, 
uh, but that broad pool of resources now can uh, allow the market to more efficiently commit resources and, and respond to changes in conditions between that and real time. Um, the market also, through its different components, um, is going to ensure that all the commitments made in the head market are feasible. It's going to consider the resource, the supply that's available. It's going to consider the transmission that's available, other grid conditions. And it's going to ensure that before it makes any kind of a commitment, that it can ensure that this is all feasible, that, it, that there's sufficient capacity and transmission to be able to support those transfers. It's not going to identify uh, certain results that are not feasible, that cannot be effectuated because it has that visibility into the real-time, into the dead head conditions of the grid, of the resources, uh, what's on outage from a resource or a transmission perspective. So it has that visibility and it knows the different uh, restrictions and limitations of resources. Because you, you can imagine that across the wider footprint, you have different types of technologies, different resources that have certain limitations. The market is going to be aware of all of those. There's a whole process of modeling resources and registering resources to account for some of these limitations. So the market is going to know of all of these factors in determining ultimately what is the most efficient uh, commitment to meet the, uh, the needs across the footprint. And then we also have been discussing this in, in, in the stakeholder process, but it's also a, a new imbalanced reserve product that's also going to be procured from this pool of resources effectively to meet some of the uh, uncertainty um, that may materialize. As you can imagine, between that hand and real time, certain conditions can change depending on the types of resources that you have. You know, you have more solar, you have more wind, you may have to account for some of the uncertainty with those resources. This imbalanced reserve product through the market is going to procure additional capacity that is going to be standing ready to, re to respond effectively to some of these quick changes in, in conditions that may materialize across the footprint. So we think that this robust resource efficiency evaluation, the imbalanced reserve product, plus ensuring that the market is providing um, feasible commitments across the footprint is going to position us in a better, it's going to position us in such a way that we can be better prepared to respond to changes in conditions, stress system conditions, and potentially avoid emergency situations than if each balancing authority area were on its own, because now you can benefit from that broader pool of resources across the footprint to respond to changes in conditions. If conditions change in one balancing authority area for the worse, you have resources, access to resources in other balancing authority area that now can be committed to respond to those changes in conditions that we see across the footprint. And the, this is the last slide again on this theme of reliability. Um, as Phil said at the beginning, participation in the EDAM, similar to the EIM, each balancing authority area continues to retain its key functions. That's not ceded to the ISO. The ISO operates the market but each balancing authority area, as they do today, retain their long-term resource planning function, they retain their long-term transmission planning function, and they retain their reliability function. Each EDAM balancing authority area is ultimately continues to be responsible for responding and, and, and meeting the reliability needs for that balancing authority area. They're responsible for meeting the NERC standards um, and, and ensuring that supply and demand continues to be balanced in, that, uh, in their balancing authority area. And as such, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the market is, to the extent that there are changes in conditions, the market is going to do all it can to position the footprint to respond to those changes in conditions. But you can imagine that there are corner cases and severe, uh, severe conditions that you know, ultimately could lead to severe emergencies across the foot. If you don't have, for example, sufficient supply in the footprint, you can envision that certain balancing authority areas may need to ultimately then, um, if the market cannot position them, the market will do everything it can, but if it cannot resolve those conditions, each balancing authority area then has fallback provisions to maintain reliability in their balancing authority area. And that includes um, each balancing authority area has certain tools and retains those tools that they have in place today to manage reliability conditions, whether that means accessing emergency assistance from a neighboring balancing authority area, whether that means uh, access to certain resources that may be they did not make available to the market or access to certain emergency resources or backup generation. But the balancing authority area in those corner cases where the market has done all it can to resolve conditions and the balancing authority area still is in a severe and in an emergency condition, that balancing authority area continues to have access to their operational tools that they have today. 
And ultimately what we put forward, and this is subject to stakeholder discussion as well, is if we are in those severe conditions and now there's risk of load shed that each individual balancing authority area may face, what we put forward is that in those conditions, consistent with good utility practice and coordination with your neighbors, uh, if load is at risk of being shed, that transfers that are sourcing from that EDAM balancing authority area effectively would have equal priority to load such that for the greater uh, confidence in transfers across the whole footprint that you would effectively on a pro rata basis, if you need to now shed load, you would be also looking to on a pro rata basis, maintain some of these transfers um, and effectively cut load on a pro rata basis with, uh, with transfers. So they would have equal priority to each other if you have to get into that severe condition. And what that does is it provides uh, confidence in transfers to others that are depending on transfers sourcing from your balancing authority to meet their needs. Um, and if another balancing authority area is in a severe condition, they're also ensuring that if you're depending on transfers from that balancing authority area, that they're not curtailing those ahead of their own load and putting you in a worse position. So it's, it's this concept of equal priority of transfers to load when you're in those severe cases and this, this across the footprint, if each, if each individual balancing authority areas in that condition, they would afford transfers equal priority to load um, in, in severe conditions. Let me pause here. I think this, this finishes the, um, the, the more substantive, the technical part of the discussion. And, and we'd certainly open it up for questions before we turn to, to some of the more process related elements. Commissioner Fielder, can you hear us? I can hear you. I, I don't have any questions at this time. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner O'Donnell? Yep. Oh. Well, if you can hear us, Commissioner O'Donnell, you're muted and we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Ah, there you are. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, uh, it's very interesting what you have uh, covered. Uh, and to be fair, I want to pose to you exactly the same circumstances I have posed to numerous uh, organizations and, uh, or individuals. And that is that, uh, as you know, uh, Montana has experienced the coldest temperatures in the history of the continental United States. Uh, just two years ago, we suffered through a, a period of time where uh, temperatures were at uh, 45 degrees below zero. Um, just uh, taking a look at the availability of baseload power in, in the West and the retirements of that, it seems to me, and I'd like your opinion on this, no matter what uh, governance there is, whatever type of sharing mechanisms, is that it doesn't seem to me that uh, anybody uh, would have any electricity to send to Montana when Northwestern uh, Energy needs to go to the marketplace to uh, keep Montanans from freezing to death in the winter. Can you help me to let me know whether or not any of your uh, proposals right here would address that that very extreme problem, which, as I say, just happened two years ago and is quite likely to happen again. Well, Commissioner, this is uh, Phil Pettengill. There's a couple of thoughts to, to share with you. Um, actually, I, I think you've highlighted something that almost all of the balancing areas in the Western interconnection are dealing with, and that is sort of these extreme events um, that are obviously happening more frequently now than we've maybe ever seen them in the past, as you've characterized in the experience you've had here in Montana. Um, and so I can assure you that as an industry, everyone is starting to try to collect the information and understand how to forecast what these kind of events could be, because in the root solution to the problem, and I think you alluded to this, it really becomes an issue of having sufficient resources to try to respond to those extreme events. Um, extreme cold is certainly, uh, you know, not a good environment to, for, for customers. And so we recognize that. 
I think what the market can do and what we've been talking about today, though, actually can provide the assistance. And I think that's where your question was going is very fair question of us. Because ultimately, one of the things that I know I've seen in my 25 years at the ISO is throughout the rest of the West, what we see is balancing areas that have peak loads and challenging times of the year that, frankly, do not occur at the same time. For us in California and in much of the Western part of the, of the this 13 states that we're talking about, we have the peak load in the summertime. And so if what you're referring to is having a peak load or a challenging operating conditions here in Montana in the wintertime, I think you will find that there are entities in the West that can provide emergency services. What we're talking about, though, is actually operating a market that will see that and make efforts to actually dispatch that energy across the available transmission and provide as much support as can be done. And it wouldn't be just relying on the balancing areas that are just adjacent to what we have here in Montana, but potentially being able to transfer energy across multiple states and hop from multiple states to Montana to try to help provide that service via the market dispatch. This is what we're talking about with transfers. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, and maybe Milos, you can expand on this a little more, is this imbalanced reserve product that we're talking about is something that's really important to California. Um, we see it as important partly because of the substantial amount of renewable resources we have. But what is important to recognize, it creates a pool of capacity across all of the EDAM entities, recognizing that all of us may have a little bit of imbalance uncertainty as we go into an operational day. But what the market can do is draw on that whole pool of resources to try to help when a particular balancing area is finding itself deficient. So uh, just a couple of thoughts in trying to be responsive. And Milos, anything else maybe to add to that? Um, Because it's really a very good and fair question to ask. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And yeah, no, I I completely agree with you. The important thing to keep in mind here is we're talking about the day ahead market the day ahead market positioning you to the extent that you're anticipating some of these conditions, it can position and commit resources, accounting for those conditions and commit resources across that wider footprint, taking into account the transmission availability. But it's also important to, to remember that there's also the Western EIM. You know, if you're participating in the EDAM, you're also participating in the real-time market. And the real-time market, similar to today, you know, is also able to respond to further changes in conditions that may occur between day ahead and real time. And like Phil said, is you then have access to a broader pool of resources across that wider footprint that can be responsive if one balancing authority area is in a challenging situation, loss of generation, you have the market will commit all the necessary resources to be able to respond to those changes in condition. I think that the day ahead and the real time work together to respond to these changes in conditions. Well, uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, I find that that a lot of that is is uh, rather academic instead of based in reality. For instance, uh, the MISO region, which has been at this for a long, long time and is, has a great amount of expertise, uh, and they have seen that uh, uh, reliable uh, baseload generation has uh, out uh, retirement has outpaced uh, any replacement for that, and uh, they seem to be saying that it'd be unavoidable that uh, if there are any uh, high temperatures in the upper uh, uh, MISO area, that they're they're going to have to have load shed. Uh, they've been at this for a long time. Uh, it seems to me uh, that uh, in uh, webinars. Uh, that I uh, participated on having to do with the uh, recent California brownouts of a year and a half, a couple of years ago, uh, that they they ended up uh, with saying, you know what, uh, the resource that you are accounting on to bail out you when you have a need, somebody else might be uh, counting on that same resource or somebody said uh, they may want to keep it themselves. Uh, my, my feeling is this, and if you, you could address this. Uh, w- again, when it gets to be minus, by the way, Montana is a summer peaking and a winter peaking uh, state. Uh, but in terms of uh, winter, 45 degrees below zero, uh, that um, 
if if all of the uh, power in in the the western area is renewables, wind and solar, in it, as I say, there's a. I, I just read the other day that California only has one percent in batteries right now. Uh, is really not going to have anything available at uh, in at nighttime. Uh, California sends out a lot of its excess uh, solar power uh, outside of the state uh, frequently, uh, but that power uh, would not be available at night to Montana. Besides which, there are there would be existing, uh, as I understand it, congestion issues in getting that here. It 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 seems to me despite all that, I mean, the EIMs and, and your, your uh, uh, schemes uh, would, would work uh, all things being equal. That is, uh, when there are in the absence of any extremes, uh, given the presence of extremes, that the system is simply not adequate because it lacks reliable baseload power. Uh, my, my summation, to the whole situation is that uh, the only way to um, to uh, provide uh, absolute resource adequacy and certainty when you have intermittent resources is if your chief engineer is Harry Potter. Uh, to me, it simply violates the laws of economics, of uh, of uh, physics, of electronics, and everything. It, I, I I I see that. Uh, basically, having a, a system that relies upon intermittency uh, can never guarantee that people will survive extreme temperatures, whether it's hot or cold. That's the end of my statement. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. President Brown, have you got any questions? Uh, I'd like to give the panel an opportunity to respond to anything that Commissioner O'Donnell said. Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. I, you know, I, I, think, I think you raised fair points. Uh, you know, the one thing that we did try to emphasize is that ultimately um, each balancing authority area remains responsible for their long-term resource plans. And I don't know, Commissioner, if you're referring to some of these baseload resources and retirements, but the EDAM is not intended necessarily to drive long-term resource planning. Uh, rather, what we're looking at is on a day-by-day -day basis in the day-ahead time frame, have you brought sufficient resources to meet your resource sufficiency um, obligation? Um, so as I, I know there's, there, there is an interplay between the two, uh, but, but in the EDAM, uh, we're looking really at that day ahead time frame. Do you have sufficient capacity to meet those day ahead obligations while leaving the obligation to the BA to look more on a long term basis to make sure that they're resource adequate to meet their long term resource plans, their long term grid needs, and, and the long term load needs? President, uh, Commissioner Johnson. Carol O'Donnell. One more thing on there. Yeah, I what what concerns me is the uh, increasing amount of retirements of baseload power. Uh, just recently, uh, Pacific Core, I think, uh, announced the retirement of four coal plants in Wyoming. I think uh, the term that was used is they were economically not viable. You know, I, I in 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 MISO and PJM, they had the auctions that. Uh, uh, now we see that they have uh, prematurely uh, uh, blocked uh, baseload power out of the out of the markets and caused early retirements. Uh, but it, it seems to me that when you're talking about economically viable and and uh, reasonable, that I can see how you quantify uh, amounts of power. What I cannot understand is how you quantify people's lives and well-being. And it seems to me that that is an element that has been uh, lost on this. Uh, people talk about uh, the, the uh, social cost of carbon. What I would like people to discuss is the social cost of decarbonization. Uh, people are dying from that, as we saw in Texas. 
and are liable to die again. The, the, the job of the Montana Public Service Commission is to look out for the for the uh, uh, adequate uh, electricity uh, availability for the people of Montana. And I, I, that is our concern. And uh, I, 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 that doesn't seem to me to be a part of any of the economic equations is, uh, is, is that, that personal factor of people's lives. I don't know how it can be quantified, uh, but it, it seems to me because it cannot be quantified that it has not been part of the conversation. And I, I find that that's a, a severe deficiency uh, to all of these conversations, Mr. Chairman. President Brown. Thank you, Vice President Johnson. I would just, Lois, if I may, call you by your first name. Uh, I was glad to hear you acknowledge that the two are intertwined um, in terms of having sufficient base load. I mean, the rest all fits around that, I would think. Other than that comment, I don't have any questions, Mr. Vice President. Are there any questions from folks in the audience at this juncture? Well, Wherever you want, that's okay. Hi, my name is Will Rosequist, uh, Regulatory Division Administrator. And uh, you may be planning to cover this later. And if so, just let me know. But I was curious about um, if kind of following on this discussion about um, resource adequacy in various time frames, day ahead versus the long-term planning aspect of it. And um, thinking about the market power um, assessments that would go on, um, and in particular, whether those market power assessments are, are conducted sort of market by market is the market power, is there a separate market power assessment for the EDAM market versus the EIM market? Or do those market power assessments look at the, look at the relationship between the two markets and how one market affects the other market downstream to make sure that there isn't manipulation going on? Great question, thank, thank you for that. Uh, yes, and uh, what we put forward, market power mitigation is a, is a component that's present in every single organized market. This is where you're looking at, you know, depending on how different resources are bidding, whether there needs to be mitigation to those bids based on whether they're, they're exercise, there's a potential for exercise of, of market power in, in a particular area. But what, what we've put forward in the straw proposal is effectively uh, having the same test and same evaluation in the day ahead and the real time, kind of a common test. Uh, between the ahead and real time time frame. So effectively extending the test that's in the EIM uh, framework today and extending that to the to the day ahead market as well. And we have a, I don't know how familiar you are, but we have also the Department of Market Monitoring at the ISO that's constantly monitoring and looking at these activities in the market and individual entities participation, uh, looking at potential manipulation uh, and they produce regular reports on a quarterly basis. But in terms of market power mitigation, we are proposing at this stage, a common test between the head and real time. Thank you. That was the only question I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Quest. Um, a, a few from here. Um, going back uh, first to this concept of uh, easy entry, easy exit, uh, understand uh, uh, that certainly uh, that needs to be addressed just from a a marketing tool, if you will, in terms of um, encouraging participation in the market. Um, does that, though, especially on the easy exit side, I mean, everyone in the market, while they're in the market, is dependent on everyone else to a great degree. 
So if we have this easy, easy exit aspect to the market, does what, what kind of risk does, does that create? You have a, a market member that's brought resources to, to the party and, and uh, they decided oh, we're, we're going to go off and be on our own. What, what is that? Uh, how impactful is that situation to the market? No, great question as well. Uh, so let me expand a little bit what we mean by ease of entry and ease of exit. Ease of entry, you know, uh, effectively we're putting forward the same provisions and same terms for entry and exit as in the EIM today, which is effectively once you voluntarily can enter into the market, you have to execute agreements and, and you know, we have to model you. There's a certain time frame before you get into the market that we do testing, et cetera. But once you're in the market, um, you have to provide, if you're going to exit, you have to provide a six month um, exit period, uh, exit notice. So similar to the EIM. And that, that's, and, and you know, it's not exit as you can exit the next day or, or the next week, because yes, we, there will be concerns about those impacts. You know, you've made certain commitments of resources and now somebody can just leave the next day. Or So there's a six month exit period where that allows for us to evaluate some of the implications of that exit, but also, uh, you know, close out settlements, and because the market is, is, you know, we're talking here about the day ahead market timeframes, you know, we don't anticipate that, you know, with a six month lead time of, of an exit notice, uh, we don't anticipate any adverse impacts to the market because the market will have plenty of time then to uh, adjust and, and you know, we'll, we'll make the necessary modeling changes to know what resources are in the market, what are the qualities of those resources, which ones are getting removed. And then the market will just operate then uh, with the resources that remain and, and the entities that remain. There's certainly no guarantee that there's going to uh, uh, be readily available replacement for that uh, that available capacity that's leaving uh, with that market member, and and so the the, the response then, conceivably at least, uh, is is simply figuring out how to equitably spread that impact across other market members? Well, Commissioner, this is Phil Pettengill. Maybe um, I thought that might be where you're going. Milos did a great job of sort of describing what's happening maybe in that sort of six month time frame that there's enough notice that folks will know that's happening. I appreciate your question because um, it takes us to a longer view of things, multiple years, per, 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 you know, particularly, um, I think it's important for all of us to remember, and this really goes to where uh, maybe Commissioner O'Donnell was going with his questions, is there's still an obligation on each of these balancing areas to do their long-term procurement planning, their long-term construction of resources. Because as we've been talking about, this market as a day-ahead market, obviously you can't build new resources with only a day-ahead notice. Um, I think all of us appreciate it takes many years possibly to build new resources and maybe longer for new transmission. So I think that's the way to think about your question is each balancing area still is going to have its own authority and also then its own obligation to have sufficient transmission and generation resources. What the market's going to do is be able to take all of those independent entities and be able to do a security constrained economic dispatch across that fleet that has then been shown to be adequate to serve the load in each one of the balancing areas as they come into the day ahead market. So from that standpoint, if one market participant were to exit, um, I think in, in my view, that shouldn't cause a burden on the others if everyone's coming in resource adequate at the, at, you know, participating in the market. In other words, you're familiar with the Western EIM. The Western EIM doesn't charge for transmission capacity. It doesn't have any costs because it's so close to real time that there really isn't any economic value to transmission that otherwise hasn't already been sold forward. So that's one of the basic building blocks. But also within EIM, like we're talking about here, each one of the participants are not allowed to lean on or rely on capacity of the other participants. That's why they need to come in resource sufficient and pass a resource sufficiency test, even in the EIM. So I think that's a foundational assumption here that each one of the balancing areas still can show that they've got sufficient uh, capacity to meet their own obligations. And the market is helping to economically evalu evaluate the uh, dispatch that can uh, squeeze out the value of, the, of that infrastructure. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it it is. I it still leaves me wondering uh, that 
First, let me ask each of you if you would agree with with this statement, and 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 that is that that potentially at least uh, the region uh, could in fact find itself regionally. Now, looking at at the, at the whole uh, question of both uh, uh, transmission and supply, uh, find themselves in conditions where, where, in fact, either the supply or the ability to get that supply where it needs to be when it needs to be there uh, simply doesn't exist. Uh, I mean, y'all had some situations last year, certainly, that were like that, as Commissioner O'Donnell pointed out. MISO, uh, kind of the, the granddaddy, is saying, oh, my gosh, we may not be able to provide enough capacity at peak uh, as, as early as this summer. Um, so potentially you would agree those conditions could exist. Um, yes. So <clears throat> given that, um, uh, and we need to be collectively very careful about how we proceed in terms of, of how our efforts, both as regulators here and, and, uh, Y'all is trying to put this market together. Are perceived mm -hmm. out there? Um, what What do you see uh, Kaiso's role? Uh, how do you see Kaiso's role in terms of helping define and encourage these individual balancing authorities to move forward to address this problem? I, I mean, certainly um, uh, we we are very concerned. Uh, uh, about uh, resource adequacy and available capacity in this the state of Montana over the next five to seven years. We, we see some very real problems there. One of the reasons I'm so intrigued by this is because it it provides at least hopefully some fallback. You know, I, I mean, the fact of the matter is it's it's rarely 45 below in Phoenix. At the same time, it's 45 below in Cutbank. So, so that creates some help there in terms of reallocating those resources. But I fear that is, as I think Commissioner Donald was intimating, we we potentially are just resource short at, at at this point, and all the market structure in the world doesn't generate a single additional electron. I think that's a fair characterization, Commissioner. Um, the rest of the West is very concerned about resource adequacy. Um, you know, it's not only the events we've had in California. But if you take a look, and I'm sure you're familiar with what's happening with the Western Resource Adequacy Program, where multiple balancing areas, multiple states are trying to come together to try to do a more long-term evaluation of their resource needs. There are now multiple studies that are out that have indicated that it looks like, uh, in, in, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, that they may very well be short in the very few coming years. Um, so I completely understand that what, what you all are characterizing here. Um, that is a challenge for the whole industry in terms of ensuring that there's enough resources. What we can do and what we have done is we've taken our expertise in helping administer resource adequacy for the state of California and help try to provide that specifically to the Northwest as they're designing their program. I think you've heard Milos and I talk about how we recognize the importance of the resource sufficiency test to help encourage the balancing areas coming into this market, because I don't think we would disagree with you. The market cannot create new capacity. What we're able to do is try to optimize the capacity that's there. But to the extent that we're able to help show that there are tight periods or entities that look like they're barely able to pass the resource sufficiency test, and we can try to help them understand why is that happening, those are some of the things that we can certainly provide as a market operator. Well, that's helpful. I appreciate that. Um, I think it, at this point, that's all I had. Is there anything else from commissioners? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, how much longer are we going to go? And I, I was I didn't want to ask questions at this point because I, I think there's more presentation to hear and I wanted to, to wait until I heard some more on this. Is, is that the plan for today? I, I believe that's that's right, Commissioner. So I I, I think uh, uh, our friends from California are ready to to go on to uh, another part of the presentation, and then we'll pause again for questions after that. Is that right? Yes. So so stick with us, Commissioner.
Okay, well, thank you. This is Holly Taylor again, and I'm going to take up our next um, slides on the Governance Review Committee and their review of governance in the the in light of the extended day ahead market. So um, I'll just note quickly um, again. Thank you for your engagement. There is an opportunity to comment on the EDAM straw proposal, which was posted on April 28th. Um, comments, I believe, are due on June 16th, but we'll come around back to that process and that opportunity. But um, given that, there's also an opportunity to comment on and engage on governance of the extended day ahead market and what that's going to look like. So there is a committee that is focusing on this effort right now. It's the governance review committee that was put together for the Western energy and balance market. Now they're expanding their scope to cover EDAM. Um, and uh, again, another opportunity for comment here, um, both through the stakeholder process and um, through the body of state regulators, which Vice President Johnson is very um, much engaged with. Um, so this slide here um, shows the current structure of the Western energy and balance market governance. Um, there is a WEAM governing body and also an ISO board of governors, and these entities share authority over any market rules that are specific to um, uh, that apply specifically to the Western energy imbalance market and participants in the Western energy imbalance market. And the WEAM governing body, um, their charge really is to bring a Western perspective to all the uh, perspective and decision making to all matters relating to WEAM and WEAM participants. So the governing body, again, represents that Western perspective. They do that through engagement with the body of state regulators, which um, is comprised of electric utility commission regulators who have participants, regulated participants participating in the market. Um, they also have um, advice to take advice from the regional issues forum. The regional issues forum um, provides a space for learning to various sectors and collects various sector perspectives. But um, the governing body makes decisions informed by various stakeholders across the West and really brings that Western view. Um, so now the GRC is charged with contemplating how this structure might need to change in light of an extended day ahead market. Um, so the governance review committee, um, it is comprised of sector representatives. There is a representative from the body of state regulators on that committee. It is um, Chair Haley Williamson from the Nevada Commission. Um, she collects feedback from her colleagues. Um, such as Vice President Johnson and others, and on what the governance should look like. So um, it is a stakeholder-driven WEAM governance review committee, and they're considering different aspects of governance um, under an EDAM design. So they're looking at what should the authority of the governing body be under EDAM? What should the scope of their authority be, the type of their authority um, and what role should stakeholders play in market design? So looking at what is the appropriate role of the body of state regulators? Does that role need to expand or um, stay the same? What is the proper um, role of the regional issues forum in advising a governing body under EDAM? Um, also looking at issues such as the nomination process for both the governing body and the ISO Board of Governors and what their mission statements are. So currently the governing body has a mission statement to promote, protect and expand the success of the Western energy and balance market for the benefit of all participants across the West. So the governing body or the governance review committee right now is looking at are there opportunities to expand the mission statement for the um, board of governors? Um, is that appropriate? So right now they're seeking some feedback on some initial um, questions. They have been conducting outreach throughout the month of May uh, this week at the May 25th, 26th EDAM straw proposal stakeholder meeting in Folsom. Uh, the Governance Review Committee will have a stakeholder panel responding to these questions about governance appropriate changes for EDAM. 
um, and, and taking more stakeholder feedback. So the, the Governance Review Committee expects to produce a straw proposal in mid-July with comments due in mid-August. Um, so here is a governance review timeline. Um, it goes back a bit. Um, in early May, the Governance Review Committee provided updates at the Body of State Regulators meeting and the Regional Issues Forum meeting. Again, it um, engaged in stakeholder outreach throughout the month of May. Um, that happened with the Body of State Regulators through Chair Haley Williamson, who is the Boston member and also represented on the Governance Review Committee. Um, and this process is just a step behind the market design, um, looking at governance and trying to build a governance design that is responsive to the market under EDAM as, as that's designed. So it's a little bit delayed. Um, but and again, another important opportunity for the commissions to engage on the EDAM and um, both the design and the governance here. Um, so happy to take any questions on that. Commissioner Fielder. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, one question that I have is regards to all this process, and that is, um, how is it being funded? Well, Commissioner Fielder, this is Phil Pettengill. Um, we are funding it as part of the ISO's ongoing uh, policy improvement and policy development. Um, this, the whole discussion around EDAM got started, frankly, with our existing Western EIM customers looking to try to create more value. And so the ISO has an ongoing uh, effort to improve our markets and try to create additional value to those customers that are in that market. So this dialogue that we are hosting um, is really part of our ongoing uh, efforts. And so we're funding all of this discussion by hosting meetings like this meeting that's coming up um, later this week on the 25th and 6th. It's actually at our facilities. Uh, we encourage folks to participate either uh, virtually or in person. Um, and we do have a couple of slides here at the end to talk about how to engage with us, you know, over the course of the next year or so. But this is really part of the ISO's process to continue to try to work with our customers and improve value where we can. Thank you. So who's funding the ISO? I mean, where, where ultimately are these funds coming from that are funding this process? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Oh, sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, I should have asked for clarification. Um, the ISO, um, functions uh, by charging the customers that participate in our market. So we have what's referred to as a grid management charge. And that charge then um, collects dollars based on volumetric uh, charges for participants that are in the markets and uh, relying on us to provide these reliability operational services that we've been uh, talking about. Now, EIM customers have uh, an additional charge that they pay, and it uh, basically contributes to that market and operational fee that we have in the GMC. Um, and so it helps to offset that. But in other words, what we're really doing is leveraging um, the economies of scale by taking the real time and day ahead markets that the ISO is already running for California and just expanding those on a proportionate basis to additional customers. And then those customers would pay the proportional rate in order to receive those services. But we have that as set up as a, as a tariff charge that is basically built on the volume of transfers that you're making through the ISO markets. Okay, thank you. Um, and then a follow up on that, Mr. Chairman, is um, just leads into the cost control. So who uh, who is responsible for making sure that the cost controls are in place and that um, these funds are actually being handled responsibly? Who, who are you ultimately accountable to? Yes. Um and, we, and thank you again, it's something that maybe we should have taken a minute and just describe a little bit of the ISO and where do we come from and, and so forth. But the short answer to your question is, we are responsible to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They oversee our tariff and our rates. Um, we do have an annual budget process where we uh, have a stakeholder meeting to go through what is the ISO's budget. 
uh, determine what that GMC rate will be charged to our customers during the course of that year. Um, in the event that um, you know costs increase or costs decrease, we uh, are authorized to adjust that charge up or down. Um, what I can tell you is we worked out a number of years ago with FERC to have a, a cap in terms of how large the total GMC budget may grow to. And um, partly because of our ability to expand the market and add EIM customers, we have not had to go back to FERC and ask for an increase in that cap. So our GMC has been flat um, for about the last 10 years as a result of our cost management and expanding uh, our services to other customers. Okay, thank you. And on the timeline here, um, comments are due by June 16th. Who are the stakeholders that you're uh, expecting comments from and engaging with in these, these meetings on May 25th and 26th? Yeah, great question, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, the stakeholders that we're referring to is really everybody. It's a broad community. Our, the ISO's stakeholder process is open to any entity that has an interest in what's happening in these wholesale energy markets. Um, so just to back up a second and describe our process, if you will, our generic stakeholder process is one where we would put out a straw proposal as we've done here. But what's unique here is we started with a set of work groups where we spent the first three months of this year talking with again, open conversation about some very critical topics. And we've touched on some of those today's, for example, the resource efficiency uh, test. Um, but then we'll put out a straw proposal. And the idea is the straw proposal lays out what we think are the challenges and the issues that need to be resolved in this policy discussion that's beginning. Okay. Uh, we'll have a number of stakeholder meetings. We'll publish the results of those stakeholder meetings. We'll see comments, and then we'll put out a revision. Um, in this case, we anticipate okay. putting out a revised straw proposal. But ultimately, we'll, we will put out then um, a, a, a draft final proposal, a policy statement, if you will, that ultimately goes to the ISO board, if it's unique to just the ISO portion of the system. But as Holly just talked about, in the case of the EDAM, because it is, we are envisioning that It'll be the EIM customers that are joining the EDAM, that are expanding their participation, that then um, any of the policies that we put forward here would also go to the Western EIM governing body for their approval um, as well. Um, so I guess it's a long way of saying the approval process and what we're going through is pretty well defined, but all stakeholders are encouraged to participate. As you might imagine, those that are going to participate in the market, like the specific utilities, um, they will tend to be much deeper into the details, if you will, but we have a broad set of customers or entities that participate, including environmental entities or other non-NGO type organizations that frequently engage in the ISO stakeholder dialogue, if you will. Thank you. Commissioner O'Donnell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have no comments uh, at, at, the, at this time. I, I just also want to give my apologies that I'm in Little Rock for a meeting of the Organization of MISO States uh, to talk about the very issues that I brought up earlier and uh, that I'm leaving for that meeting in a couple of minutes. So I will have to disengage at this time. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Thank you. President Brown, any other questions? this time no questions thank you buddy from yeah And, and Commissioner Johnson, I just want to let you know, we did want to, we had one more slide to make sure we wrap up the stakeholder process. Um, and so whenever is the right time to try to do that. And Mr. Vice President, I, I have some general comments to share from Northwestern's perspective, not specific questions. So perhaps I could wait till the end for that, whichever you think. Okay. All right, so let me do this. Let me just kick it off. And then uh, if Milos has a few other things to add, we'll do that um, because this is, this is our, our last slide. Um, 
What we wanted to do is share with all of you uh, how to engage with us. And so Commissioner Fielder's question was right on in terms of the stakeholders and how we go about things. And I probably should have flipped to this slide as, as she and I were having our dialogue. But what's important to recognize here, over the as we wrap up April and we wrap up May, we're going to now have this stakeholder meeting uh, later this week, uh, a day and a half. Uh, Milos can give us a little more details about what we're going to talk about and when, where, and how, but really uh, a full day and a half of diving into the details of the extended day ahead market design. Afterwards, as Holly mentioned, on June 16th, we'll be looking for comments back from stakeholders. So again, stakeholders opportunity to give us comments. When those comments come in, it's really important to recognize we take comments and we post them on the website under these policy initiatives. So you can, all of us can see what the various stakeholders are saying um, in regards to this initial straw proposal. We are anticipating that, again, this is very technical, and so we may very well need to have some workshops, some more detailed conversation on various topics that come out of that day and a half on the 25th and 6th. But ultimately, as I mentioned a minute ago, we anticipate putting out a revised straw proposal go through this cycle again with a stakeholder meeting comments and so forth and leading then to that draft final proposal that I mentioned. Um, and then finally bringing a policy proposal to the ISO board by the end of the year. Now, next year, what we anticipate happening is since we are a FERC regulated entity, we would then make a FERC filing in the early part of 2023 with a set of tariff provisions. Um, Anybody, of course, can participate in that FERC process and engaging with comments and concerns to that commission, allow that commission to then uh, uh, optimistically approve that policy that we've put forward. And then we'll have to move into what we've referred to here as our implementation activities. Um, anytime we launch a new market element like this, it's really important for us to get all of our software tools and so forth developed, but then we make them available to the customers. So the customers can actually go through what we refer to as a market simulation. We'll create an opportunity for them to engage with those tools in a market-like uh, environment. So they get a feel for what it would look like and how the results would be posted and how can they engage with us on an in and out basis um, when that market is actually running. We'll run that for a period of time. We always have a set of test criteria to be able to evaluate whether market participants and the software is performing the way we anticipate it to do so. And then right now we're uh, targeting the first quarter of 2024 to actually launch EDAM with that first set of customers. Now, as both Milos and I have said, you know, joining EDAM is a voluntary uh, uh, venture. So um, we may very well have just a handful of customers when we first start, um, but we do anticipate EDAM to be uh, um, expanding over time, um, but uh, we expect it to be up and running by early 2024. Um, Milos, anything to add to that in terms of just characterizing what we see happening over the course of the next couple of years? No, I think I think you you captured it, Phil. The one thing I wanted to just provide a bit more detail on is on this May twenty fifth and twenty sixth stakeholder meeting. Phil captured we're going to go over the, the the entirety of the proposal, but we're also going to have a number of uh, stakeholder panels where stakeholders are going to come up and share perspectives, reactions, um, new ideas, new concepts on a number of the different elements of the proposal. Resource sufficiency evaluation being one. How transmission is made available as well being another one. So uh, we'll, we're looking forward to hearing just from stakeholders that are on those panels that really span the different sectors of the industry and different areas of the region. So if, you, if, you, if you have an opportunity, that would be a good time to, to listen in. Mr. Chairman, if I could just get a clarification. Absolutely, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, when you're describing customers, who, who are you talking about? Are you talking about the actual um, energy companies, the transmission companies, who are the customers you're speaking of, please? Yes, uh, we're talking about uh, market participants. So it's usually balancing authority areas, load serving entities, um, or other entities that participate in, in our market in some way. There may be some consultants that are representing a number of different interests that are on some of these panels. But uh, yeah, the panelists will range from, from different sectors of market participants across the, the Western interconnection. Okay, hey, um, I am really pleased that Northwestern is is here, and I apologize for the short notice, but uh, 
Uh, Holly will attest, uh, we're, we're living proof that, that government really can move expeditiously. I think it was uh, exactly a week ago that we had our conversation to say, when should we do this? And came up with today. So we uh, put it together in, in short order, and I appreciate you accommodating our schedule. Joe. Hi, uh, Joe Steinmetz uh, with Northwestern uh, Vice President Johnson, President Brown, commissioners, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, even on short notice, uh, this is a topic that is always on my radar and always on the radar of a number of people at Northwestern. So I'm happy to come in and speak a bit about it today. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, First, I'd, I'd really like to express Northwestern's appreciation for the efforts that the CAISO has put into the development of this market, along with a number of stakeholders. Uh, they mentioned this process beginning in January. That's just the latest phase of this process. It's really been going on for several years. And as I think you can appreciate, there is a tremendous amount of detail and complication to putting a design together like this. So appreciate their efforts to get it to this point. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been following uh, from the beginning really since we made the decision to join EIM, uh, the discussions about EDAM were already underway at that point and we've been, we've been participating all along. In fact, my colleague, Andrew McLean will be in Folsom later this week for the stakeholder meetings. Uh, as you know, we're also engaged in a uh, number of other efforts in the region, including the Western Resource Adequacy Program. And, and if I could, I'd like to take a minute just to talk about that program very briefly and how it relates to EDAM. Uh, as I think came out a little bit in the earlier discussion, uh, a day ahead market doesn't replace the need for resource planning and Northwestern's planning process will need to continue uh, the Western Resource Adequacy Program will be a good tool for the region to use to focus on the longer term planning. That program itself will deal with the upcoming summer and winter seasons and, and uh, you know, the focus will be on seven months from now and a year after that and so on. But it will also give a view into the two years out and five years out situation in the region. And, and so combined with each utility's planning process, that's where we address the, uh, the issue of whether we have enough steel in the ground to meet those, those uh, challenging times. What a market like EDAM can do is make much more efficient use of the resources that are in the ground than you could otherwise have. Uh, really, it's, it's maybe a little bit more advanced than this, but it's not uh, too much of a stretch to say that uh, the bilateral market is really uh, an entity that foresees being short, making phone calls to, to its neighbors. And there are only so many phone calls you can make in the, in the amount of time you have. Uh, the advantage of a, of a market like EDAM would be an automated dispatch and knowledge of all the resources in the whole region and uh, you know everything geared toward trying to get the energy where it needs to go. Again, in the day ahead and real time timeframes, not, not addressing what needs to happen over the coming years to have enough resources in place. Uh, Northwestern has also been involved in the discussions with the Southwest Power Pool, who is also developing a day ahead market in the West, uh, referred to as Markets Plus. And so we are in, engaged in both conversations. That effort is uh, maybe on a, a, a slightly behind the timeline of, of EDAM, but not significantly. They're gonna be publishing uh, effectively a straw proposal later this summer. I think by the end of September, they plan to do that. There's much interest in that market as there is in EDAM as well. And, uh, it's Northwestern's view that having alternatives at this stage is good. I think it it uh, causes each market operator probably to to own its products a little bit better and to know that they're not the only choice for for parties. Uh, and that does require a lot of effort by utilities such as Northwestern and a, a 
you know, it is a significant amount of work, but we do think it is important to have alternatives and really to uh, wait to commit to either choice until we have a good idea of what the final design of each of them will look like. And so we don't want to rush into a decision. I think uh, a lot of our, our peers in, in the region share that view as well. Obviously, to make a decision about what market to join, the things that we talked about today are important, the specifics of the market design, the specifics of the governance, but it probably goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Another important consideration is what transmission connectivity you would have to the other market participants. And what follows from that is that it's important to Northwestern, uh, to Northwestern's decision making, uh, what our neighbors plan to do as well. If all of our neighbors went one direction, it probably wouldn't make sense for us to go the opposite. And so it is a little bit of a chicken and an egg, but that's why we have to have discussions with our with our peers, participate in the stakeholder processes and and really get a good handle on what the pros and cons of each of each market is. I guess uh, in, in, clothing, in closing, I would say that uh, a day ahead market really has the potential to provide both reliability and economic benefits to our customers. Uh, and that goes not just for Northwestern, but for all the other utilities in the region as well. So it is an important decision. We think there's a lot of value potentially on the table here. And we appreciate CAISO's work to date and to them coming here uh, to talk about it today. Obviously, we don't have time to dive further into the details today, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions I can now or to come back another time or to meet with your staff or however you would like to, to gather more information about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steinmetz. Anything from commissioners for Mr. Steinmetz? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Commissioner Fielder. Ms. Commissioner Fielder, just uh, thank you, Mr. Steinmetz, for being here. Your comments helped shed some light on what is a fairly new topic to this commissioner, so I appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. You're welcome. Ali, uh, Milos, Phil, anything to that? I um, am curious as to what, if any, uh, impact uh, uh, there is on your evaluate, your being Northwestern's evaluation uh, of this, given the fact that you do have, of course, an existing relationship with SPP in another part of your service area. Yeah, we're actually in kind of a, if not unique, at least a, a, a limited situation in that we have a relationship with CAISO through the EIM and we have a relationship with SPP. Uh, through our South Dakota business. So um, I think it does help provide perspective just in terms of uh, language and how the, the different entities like to discuss things and how they frame things. Uh, we have a good relationship with both and, and we, uh, you know, we have had a good working relationship with both. Um, really, it will come down to, for us, I think, the, the specifics of the design and governance along with, uh, you know, what sort of the critical mass of our neighbors uh, decide to do. Thank you for that. Um, let me, if if we're ready for some more Q&A, is that where we're, we're at now? Um, some thoughts that uh, uh, that I've had while I'm, I'm sitting here. One, I'd, I'd be interested in in uh, any of, of y'all's uh, observations as to how the dialogue at the recent Krepsi meeting went, um, I uh, I found uh, found it to be interesting to say the least, and uh, just wondered if you've got any thoughts about uh, uh, what kind of message you came away from with that dialogue uh, there. Yeah, this is Milos for the California ISO. No, I think we found the, the, the discussion fairly interesting. And, and, you know, I think we identify, or at least we've heard about some of the challenges that the West continues to face. And, you know, for my part, at least the conversation I've been in, and, and it seems that the West is 
ready at least to look and consider uh, a broader day ahead market. Uh, you know, there's even discussions of a regional transmission organization or RTO, which is different than the market. It's at that point, it's one single balancing authority area with one single transmission planning function, one single resource planning function. Uh, but you know, I think I think we found the the discussions interesting. A lot of changes in the in the in the Western interconnection with the different look at resource adequacy through the Western Power Pool. You have our EDAM, you have SPP Markets Plus. Um, so I think, uh, you know, what I walked away with was the openness, at least, uh, from Western entities to explore these, uh, new programs and, and new offerings and, and helping address some of the issues that we all commonly face. All right. Yeah, and just building off of what Milos said, I think, you know, what's evident from these conversations is that we've really turned a corner with respect to regional collaboration and engagement again on these regional efforts. And um, there's ground and it's important that we move forward together and the ground has been laid and there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, we share um, common challenges and need to work together over a broader footprint to resolve those challenges, to face those together. You all both uh, being Kinder, I guess, more diplomatic than uh, uh, than I would be. I, I came away from the session uh, with a significant level of frustration in that uh, uh, where I did find consensus, it was in terms of the magnitude of the challenges that exist in the West, Western region, where I found virtually no regional consensus was how we fix it. Um, I look at uh, what we've just talked about, Western Power Pool, SPP, y'all, uh, and then add to that uh, groups like uh, Governor Ritter's Wired Group, uh, Senator Hansen's group. Uh, we've got more, I won't even say necessarily competing interests, but more interests being uh, uh, championed here in, in the West than we can, can shake a stick at. And I, uh, I don't know, uh, there's going to have to be an entity at some point that's going to have to bring some, some uh, uh, consistency and consolidation to all of this, this activity. And I, I don't know if that's a role that CAISO can, can ultimately uh, uh, take on or, or not, but I'd be interested in your response to that. Commissioner Phil Pettengill, um, I'll, I'll just say this. I, I think you can see, given the discussion we've had today, is while we're open to stakeholder input, and it's important for us that the design we come up with is based on what the stakeholders and market participants find will be of value to them. Um, that's why I wanted to talk about the GHG slide. Um, that may not be important to, to you and this commission at this point in time, but um, it was interesting to see that the stakeholders designed and came up with a possible solution for us to consider. That's all good. But to answer your question more directly, what I would say is ultimately we do have to have a design that goes before FERC and gets approved. At that point, we now have a federal tariff. And so those are the rules. That becomes the rules of the road. And, and we want to make sure that that is attractive to our potential customers. But I think uh, to answer your question, that starts to create a real set, set of discipline in regards to how those EDAM entities would continue to work together, but also operate consistently uh, across a much larger footprint. And so I would say for me personally, that's the, one of the things that markets can do is instead of having 38 different ways of operating the electric grid, we start to zero in on a more consistent manner. We've, we've got some neighbors in the region that uh, apparently have perfected the technology to color code electrons because they've made it clear that in the not too distant future, they're not going to welcome any of our dirty black electrons. Um, uh, how does, in all seriousness, that kind of state-by-state of -state policy question I mean, I, we, 
we're sitting here today, we're still generating a lot of electrons with coal. And if there are uh, members of the market that say, oh, you can't use those to, to accomplish this goal of allocating available capacity, how, how do you, how do you, what happens? How do you react to that? Well, we, we recognize that there are going to be these different GHG or carbon policies across the different states. I think what I've tried to describe in our conversation today is we can use these electric markets to reflect those policies because ultimately the markets are really run on economics. And that's why I've tried to really be hopefully precise enough in my language to point out that what we do in these markets is to price the carbon. If we can price that, then what happens is the market ends up with a desirable economic dispatch because those carbon or other environmental policies now are being reflected in the outcome prices. Um, that doesn't say in any way an absolute conclusion that certain resources from certain states can't be sold to others. But what it does is puts a very strong economic signal on what gets moved from one uh, area to another. So I hope that's responsive, but what we can do is, is reflect those policies in the market pricing. Well, and I, I do understand how you can kind of balance out the generation with a carbon cost versus the generation without a carbon cost. And, and, and that's pretty clear to me, but I'm talking about states that have said that, that they're no longer going to accept our generation so, so how do you, I'm not altogether clear how you balance that out. If, if you've got a couple of hundred megawatts sitting here that now can't go necessarily to where it's needed when it's needed there to accomplish the goals of the market. Yeah, ultimately, you know, they're certainly going to have to decide, well, then where does that, using your example, the 200 megawatts come from? Because if no longer the transactions that maybe you've had over a period of time can continue, then um, as we've been talking about, the specter of resource adequacy starts to play out and say, well, what have they done to replace the 200 megawatts that they're no longer willing to purchase, right? And that, that really becomes that long-term procurement and planning uh, exercise. Um, just a couple of more. Um, uh, you talk, Philip, about... Uh, um, with the initial rollout of the extended day ahead, probably a relatively few number of, of members in the market. What, what is the uh, uh, threshold of membership for viability of the market and what is the time frame in which that's got to be reached? Yeah, um, I don't know, Milos. I, I don't, I'm not aware that we've done an analysis or determined that we have to have a minimum participation. Um, if, if I just draw by analogy, um, you're familiar, Commissioner, on what we did with the Western EIM. We started with a single entity, Pacificor, and Pacificor was, a, it was able to help us get started. What we did then is, um, you know, we uh, uh, charged them um, a proportionate rate to join and get started. But again, I think as I've mentioned earlier on in our discussion today, what we're really doing is taking ISO software, hardware, technology in general, and just using the economies of scale of leveraging that. So it's not a tremendous expense for us to be able to layer on these new capabilities. Um, I don't know, Milos, any thoughts on, is, is, there, is there a minimum? I, I, mean, I don't know that we have anything that suggests we have to have a minimum you know, to, to, to kick it off. That's right, that's right. There's not a minimum. Obviously, each EDAM entity will have to do their own assessment and analysis of EDAM participation, their cost benefits assessment individually, but there's not a minimum. Like Phil said, you know, we started with, with one entity as we started the process other you know we started seeing the benefits other entities became interested as well and that's where we are today uh with an expanded footprint but uh, like i said e each entity will need to make their own determination based on their own benefits analysis and based upon the final design of the, of the policy yeah i just want to expand on that so so we're clear right we're talking about sort of two sets of of, of costs 
Um, your question was very fair, Commissioner, in regards to is there a minimum threshold for us, the ISO, to be able to launch it? Um, but Milos touched on another one, which, of course, is that what we found in EIM, for example, sometimes some of the new EIM entities, they did need to do some investment in their own system. Um, I don't know, Joe, maybe you could touch on what your guys' experience was, you know, potentially having to upgrade some metering or doing some other things like that in order to be able to work with the ISO's technology. So there is a, a, a piece of the puzzle where they may have to spend some dollars, but we're really anticipating that's a pretty low threshold in joining EDAM because um, we're expecting it's going to be the EIM entities that are already working with the ISO, just now moving into the day ahead process. Um, and so then from a technology standpoint, those upgrades that are necessary should be really nominal in, in order for them to expand into the day ahead market. Um, just a, a two more, uh, and this next one is, is maybe not fair and, and, and maybe there's not an answer. And I'm just curious when we look at, um, Pretty significant, significant activity, both on the part of KISO and the part of SPP in terms of efforts to organize. Um, down the road, let's just brace a hypothetical here. SPP gets some Western states signed up and KISO has some others signed up. Is there any potential for, for any kind of cooperative effort between uh, existing markets? For that to become the case? Well, again, Phil Pettengill here. I, I'll respond by telling you, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I led the project here over the last few years at the ISO to actually um, have us start providing reliability coordinator services across the West. Now, this is very technical and gets into the operating standards and requirements that are promulgated by FERC and NERC, and we've touched on that. But what we saw is an opportunity to actually be the reliability coordinator for as much of the West that wanted to participate with us. Not all of the Western balancing areas elected to take that RC service from the Cal ISO. A number of them elected to take service from SPP um, because SPP is already the reliability coordinator for their operational footprint. But you don't have to be the market operator to be the reliability coordinator. And so in this case, SPP then had a number of balancing areas in the West where they were providing RC service to them. What that meant was that created an interface between us as the ISO RC and SPP RC. Um, we have been very collaborative, very cooperative in, in conducting those, those affairs. Um, we first needed to figure out which customers was going to be where, um, but because we're, we're both market operators, we're already familiar with the network design and the tools and the resources that are required for an RC to perform its function. And what I can share with you, Commissioner, is that relationship has been very positive and construction um, setting that up. Um, moving on, we're, of course, now talking about a market design where there may be, as you're suggesting in the scenario, a scene between two markets. Well, again, we've got the opportunity to look at what's happened in multiple other ISOs. Um, we coordinate uh, and collaborate across multiple ISOs in the country. And you know, places between like MISO and SPP or PJM and MISO and the other ISOs have had seams now for multiple years. And so then aligning the market design where you have two market seams, a lot of those issues have already been seen and dealt with um, in those other markets. So we are not anticipating if, if the future world that you've described comes to fruition, we're not anticipating any, uh, any major uh, uh, challenges in terms of us being able to uh, resolve those seams issues between two potential markets in the West. Glad to hear that. Um, the only other question I have, go back to uh, the Krebsy meeting and conversations there. Um, I came away uh, feeling that there were um, uh, a number of folks there who thought an RTO was an absolute necessity and a number of folks there who thought RTO was absolutely a huge mistake and we shouldn't even contemplate going there. So we're, we're pretty much at far ends of the spectrum in, in that regard. 
I'm just curious about y'all's thoughts on, on RTO. Is, is the EIM and the day ahead market, are those precursors to an RTO in y'all's mind? Or is, are, are those tools going to be adequate for the West? Uh, where do we go in, in terms of that next step? Well, again, uh, Phil Pettengill, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be responsive here by saying this. Um, if there's one thing we know about the Western interconnection, it likes to move in incremental steps. No big bites, right? Um, so I think what you were hearing was those some of those entities that are ready to take the next step or potentially take the big bite. But as a group, I would say my experience working here for the last few decades is incremental is the answer to the question. So, um, so what are we doing? Um, I mean, first of all, let me just for terminology point out, we refer to ourselves as an ISO, but when we look at the criteria that FERC's established for an RTO, a regional transmission organization, we feel pretty confident that we meet all that criteria. So ISO, RTO in our mind is synonymous. There, it, It's the same. From that perspective, I'll start in saying this to you that we're already then operating as an RTO for the California footprint that we have, right? And Milos touched on it earlier, a couple of the key things that start to happen moving from these real time and day ahead markets into an RTO is in fact creating more, more value. But uh, go back to the basic principle of doing things incre incrementally. I suggest that um, as you wrapped up your question, I think you're right. What we'll probably see is we'll see a Western resource adequacy program. We'll see a Western day ahead market that is also built on a real-time market. And when folks get a little more comfortable with what those are, some period of time now from now, then we'll move on and say, now what's the next set of value proposition that can be achieved in working together and collaborating across 13 states and 38 different balancing areas? What we've seen in California, the primary benefits to start to come out of that are some of the things that Milos mentioned. In one case, a centralized transmission planning process. Because what happens in a centralized planning process is you start to recognize that there are inefficiencies by having two BAs right next to each other planning their system on their own. As a California ISO, I'll just share with you early on in our uh, uh, lifetime, so going back 25 years, we actually were tracking the hundreds of millions of dollars of transmission investment that were not necessary because we were finding solution that bridged across the original three balancing areas rather than each of them doing their independent transmission planning processes. So having a single planner really gets you one step closer to the longstanding debate we've seen in the West, which is how come we don't have a regional planning process? Because now the ISO de facto becomes the regional planner for however large or small that that footprint is. So I'll just use that as one quick example of how moving to an RTO can create some fairly substantial value and benefits, um, but it has to then be centralized. And as you and I have talked about earlier today, Commissioner, there has to be then a fairly specific set of rules that people are willing to work within in order to make that happen. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Well, it it is. It, it unfortunately raised for for, for y'all. It raised one more one more question. Um, again, talking about consensus or lack of consensus at Krebsy, I, I I think we'd all agree there's certainly no consensus in terms of how to approach a regional transmission plan at this point. That we, we it's just not there. Um, that has led to at least some conversation. Uh, through, for example, the Wired Group with, with Governor Ritter of trying to put together uh, sub-regional groupings of states um, uh, that have been discussed, maybe uh, uh, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, just as a pulling that out of the air, but a, a group like that to sit down and look at a maybe a sub-regional transmission plan states with 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 some common interests and challenges that that might come up is is from you all y'all's perspective some merit to perhaps looking at that approach and then hoping those those sub-regional efforts might provide building blocks that could be pulled together for a, a wider uh, approach to the regional effort well again you've asked the question right down my alley um the wired effort that you're referring to um, 
actually began, well, almost three years ago now. And the ISO has been engaged and involved in that wired effort from its very beginning. As you know, um, and for the benefit of everybody else here, there were sort of three main committees set up. Um, one was to talk about transmission, and I'll come back to that. But also there was one around resource adequacy and one around uh, GHG accounting. Um, um, I have been the ISO's representative on the resource adequacy uh, wired group. Um, and so we did some really good work in, in, in that first year or so. Not a lot has been done in the last year or so. Uh, the focus has truly really transitioned to transmission and GHG conversations. Um, but the transmission group has still continued to have a dialogue and we've been very supportive. Um, I, I totally agree with you. And I think we're behind the notion of if it's not a full region, then maybe subregions that can get together and in a collaborative way, start looking at the value of transmission planning across a larger footprint. So we would be supportive of that, mostly because we've just been involved in the wired effort from its very beginning. Thank you for the, for that. I don't have anything further. Um, do you all have anything else you'd like to share with us at this point? Um, anything else from either folks in the audience or uh, you know staff or commissioners? I've got another couple questions here. Oh, Commissioner Fielder, fire away. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, so. Touching back on the GHG accounting, um, my question is, you know, when you, one of your slides early on talked about that as one of the factors and, and some states will have carbon adders and some states won't. And so your process will account for that. And I presume that's where this GHG accounting um, uh, component comes into play. I, I, my question is just when the cost of carbon is added to the price, who receives those proceeds? Where, where does it go? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good question. Um, I'll just describe it this way in regards to how we're doing it in the Western EIM, because the question is still in, in play in, in the EDAM. But as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're, we're leaning towards doing something very comparable to the EIM. So, um, and then let me also say in regards to the EDAM, it's important to recognize that in our time frame here, when we start in 2024, we will continue to only have California that actually has a carbon price uh, established through their uh, cap and trade program. But um, you may be aware that Washington is uh, expecting to implement their cap and invest program, which is very, very similar to California. Um, but they would not having been run any auctions yet to establish what the carbon price is by early 2024. That may not occur for another year or more. So that being said, um, we are certainly anticipating that early on in the life of EDAM, we would have two areas and two potentially different carbon prices. Um, in the longer term, we do anticipate that Washington and California may link their programs, and there's a very specific uh, process to go through for them to agree on that linkage. But one of the benefits of that is to create then a, a homogeneous or single carbon price across those two footprints. Um, that would then take us back to something that's very similar to what I was just going to describe, and that's how the Western EIM works. So what, what's happening now is any generator outside the state of California um, may elect to sell its energy to California or not. And the way the market is constructed to support that is they can reflect um, some number of megawatts that have a carbon price associated with them. So in other words, when they're inputting their bids into the EIM, they're gonna give us a price for the energy, a bid price for how many megawatts at a certain dollar value. But then they also have an opportunity to give us a second aspect to that bid. Maybe it's a different number of megawatts all the way down to zero or a different price. And that price is reflecting what their carbon cost is. So if they were going to be selling into California, which today is the only carbon price we have in the West, let's take a number and just say that was $11 because that's the way California's carbon auction cleared most recently, then we would expect to see their energy price plus $11. 
Now, what the market will do then is look at which generators are being dispatched up, let's say, to be able to serve a need for energy in the California marketplace. So if California was short 100 megawatts and we have a 200 megawatt generator outside of California that's willing to sell all of its capacity into California, the issue will then be, is a generator in California at a lower price than the generator outside plus the $11? If that's not the case, then the EIM market will dispatch the external generator and uh, by setting a nodal price based on their bid cost plus the carbon. And the energy then flows to California and loads and all the, all the energy transactions work. The second part of your question then was who gets the money? Well, because California load serving entities required the incremental energy and that demand for energy set a new price based on this now $11 carbon from the external generator, then they, as the load serving entities, will pay that full energy price. The ISO will collect it from them and then pay the external generator both of those bid components, not only the energy price plus the $11, because they now have a carbon obligation to the California Air Resources Board for that $11 times however many megawatts there were. So they're held revenue neutral. They, if their energy had not been sold to California, they of course would have been paid just their energy price that they bid into. But because the energy was sold to California, they'll get their energy price plus the carbon and it'll be the California consumers that are paying that cost. I hope that's helpful. It was, thank you. Uh, Vice President Johnson, Commissioner Fielder, uh, I just want to note that to date, Northwestern has elected not to be considered for delivery into California within the EIM. Uh, so we have not, uh, to this point, had to deal with the regulatory obligation with the, with the California Air Resources Board. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Field, further questions? Well, yes, it, it does lead into my next question, and that is, um, and you touched on it, Phil, thank you for that. Um, so how are these day ahead market prices determined? Uh, what methodologies are used? Um, I know that what you do is you examine the uh, supply and demand bids, correct? And then you make a selection of sl supply based on, is that high bid or low bid? Um, and same with the, the demand yeah. selection, is that high bid or low bid? Can you explain how that works um, in as uh, close to layman terms as you can get? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, I really want to invite you to participate in, um, in a training session that we're going to be having. And Holly, you can share with Commissioner Fielder a little more details after I'm done answering her technical question, right? Just literally next week, where we're going to spend um, a, a number of hours going through what I'm going to try to do for you in probably five minutes or less. Um, but we really want to describe and help uh, regulators from around the West understand how is the EIM working, how does this day ahead market work, and so forth. One element of that uh, training that we're putting together is, is an answer to your question. Um, let me just put it this way. Um, it is not, yes, we receive bids. So a generator gives us a uh, price for the amount of energy that they're willing to sell. Now, the first level of complexity could be here is different types of generators, of course, have different operating efficiency levels. So they could be considered a multi-stage generator and therefore have different prices depending on what their operating level is. But let's just assume the straightforward uh, generator has a single price for all of its available capacity that it could sell into the market. That becomes just a single price quantity bid that's entered. Now, I mentioned earlier before the notion of a nodal uh, pricing market. Now, all of the wholesale markets that are under FERC jurisdiction in Northern North America here use nodal pricing uh, as of today. Um, and so the way that works is, and let me just draw, uh, try to narrow our, our example here to just California. Within our California footprint, there are 6,000 nodes in that system. And so think of these nodes as injection points and takeout points on the wholesale electric grid. 
So a generator might be located there or a major uh, um, transmission substation to take the load off and take the energy off for load might be located there. But these 6,000 points are modeled in our software. Now, what we do then is we recognize that there is going to be some transmission losses and or constraints on the grid. And so even though our first generator might actually have the lowest price, if the transmission line leading to some load is out of service for maintenance or it's have a, had some sort of failure, or for that matter, there's enough energy flow already on that line that we cannot dispatch the least cost generator, then we may have to go to a generator that's closer to the load, but that may be a higher price. So with this basic concept, you see what's happening is nodal prices are made out of three different price components. The first is, what is the marginal cost of energy? If the market software finds the next generator to serve the next megawatt of energy, what is its clearing price? And let's just say for discussion that that's $20. Um, even though the market is serving the energy now at $19, the marginal price being 20 becomes the nodal price for energy on all 6,000 nodes because it's the marginal price. We differentiate all of those nodes by looking at the next two components. The first one is those losses that I mentioned. Moving energy across the transmission grid does have some inherent losses to it. Not a lot, but it can differentiate the price. And the third component then is the one I mentioned, which is congestion. If we cannot use the cheapest generator, then what's the next cheapest generator that could serve that load? And when we combine all three of those components, the market software is then determining possibly as many as 6,000 different prices. Now, sometimes those nodes have a similar price, but you see where I'm going with this is, it's now based on the nodal price that the market solves for every five minutes that then determines the new dispatch instruction that goes to every generator on the grid. Now, that's 6,000 nodes in California. If we add the rest of the Western EIM, I think we have somewhere in the range of about 5,000 or more additional nodes that cover the Western EIM. So our market software now is solving for these nodal prices on over 11,000 nodes every five minutes. And that's why we're dispatching um, all those generators that are participating in the EIM on a five minute basis. Um, that then determines the price and the output of the respective generators in the market. Um, is that informative? Commissioner Fielder? Philip, have we still got Commissioner Fielder? Well, I thought it was a swell answer, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vice like President Johnson, if I may, I'll just add, as uh, Phil indicated, on June 1st and 2nd, we'll have a Western Electricity Markets training located in Salt Lake City. It is an in-person training, but the ISO team, the training team will cover um, in depth, the Western energy imbalance market, the current day ahead market, Phil and Milos will go into the extended day ahead market. We'll have a report from the Department of Market Monitoring on how they mitigate market manipulation. And also part of that includes a game-based simulation training where participants can engage as entities bidding generation into a market to see how, you know, at what bid is their generation accepted or denied? Do they get to sell or, or do they fall outside of um, the range that's accepted into the to meet demand? Um, so a really exciting training. Um, it will be recorded. It won't 
stream live, but it will be recorded and we'll have sessions of the recordings available on the Western Energy Imbalance Market site under the body of state regulators. So I'd be happy to share contact information. I think there are a few openings left for anybody who wants to attend in person. We've already signed up two of our staff people for Very the good. training. I think you could sneak in another if, if you wanted to. Um, Mr. Chairman. Oh, oh, sorry. Commissioner Fielder, you're back with us. Yes, I am. I, I could hear you, but for some reason, my computer blanked out and wouldn't let me uh, make adjustments in the Zoom screen here. But um, thank you for the answer. And um, it I, I kind of had to laugh because it, it sounds like the training is, <laughs> is something that someone would need probably extensive training to, to really fully comprehend all this. But, you know, I, I quicked um, before the meeting um, when I knew we were going to have this topic, I did a, a couple just checks on the internet to kind of help myself get a little bit familiar with the topic. And I, there was one thing that I read that, um, that I was really wanting clarification on, and it was from Science Direct, and it said day ahead markets. And I, I launched, I, please, if you will, just tell me if you agree with this or disagree with this statement. Day ahead markets follow two main methodologies, the centralized nodal and bilateral pricing methods. Price is determined by examining all supply and demand bids, and then the supply is selected from the highest supply bid and demand is selected as the lowest demand bid for market transactions. Is that true or false? That's true. It's following a supply demand curve. So we match those and where they cross, then that's, the, that's essentially the clearing price. Thank you. President Brown. Uh, the only thing that I would echo is um, we understand as a commission the importance of the discussion today, and that's why we are sending staff down to Salt Lake to start beefing up on this issue. I really appreciate your coming today, on, especially on short notice, as the vice president said. This is a discussion that we've been having with our uh, legislative oversight committee. Um, We've been communicating to our legislators the importance of our staff being able to stay on top uh, of what I call the regionalization of power generation and transmission. And today's presentation is just reinforcement of that. So thank you for your time this morning. Holly? Yeah, I just thank you for those remarks and thank you again for allowing us to be here today. I just want to invite yourselves and your staff to a um, contact us at any time if you have any follow-up questions. I know we're going to dive further and further into the market design and the governance itself, so a lot of questions might um, come up in the near future or the longer-term future, and we're happy to engage, happy to visit again, happy to engage on a virtual meeting, whatever is needed to support your, um, your needs. Appreciate that, and I have to say that uh... When there have been questions, uh, uh, the Kaiso organization has been very responsive, and we're we're appreciative of that. Mr. Steinmetz, anything further from Northwestern? <clears throat> well, we finished early. You almost never get in trouble for finishing early, and uh, I uh, I appreciate uh, you all coming. I appreciate uh, the uh, uh, involvement of. Uh, staff and uh, Joe, you and Shannon for being here. Thank you for that. So uh, with that, then we will close this informational meeting with our great thanks.